New Hope TV, your encounter with God. Hello, welcome to Yeshua Saves International. It is such a joy that you can join us today as we study God's Word. We're going to talk more about our wilderness journey as we come out of Mitzrayim, our Egypt, and we continue into the Promised Land. You remember, in the book of Deuteronomy, it spoke about the last book of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, it accounts or summarizes the journey of the children of Israel that Moses, Moses accounts for it. And if you remember, from Exodus 12 to Deuteronomy 34, it is happening all in the wilderness. Now, the word for spoke is the word davar. The word for wilderness is midbar. So you add a mem, the letter mem, to the front of davar, and it becomes midbar. You see, speaking and wilderness is the same word except for that one letter. The Debar of God happens in the Midbar. And we have to get away in the wilderness sometimes to listen to God in, in our lives. Usually, Satan's voice is not drowned out, but God's voice is. The desert causes us to rely on Him and stay put. This is why we are sometimes commanded to be still and know that He is God. The desert is a place of death, but it is where God gives His Word. Unless we die to ourselves, we cannot hear the words of God. This is why being put on the altar is so important, brothers and sisters. What is on the altar goes up. But before we get to the altar, let's talk about the desert. The desert is a place of total reliance upon God. Remember, there were 2,600,000 men and their wives and their children who came out of the land of Egypt. They were going into the promised land and they had to go through the desert. So some estimates say there were almost 2 million people. There was no water, there was no food. God had to supply every mouthful of food and the water for them. It was a place of extreme heat and God had to provide shade in the form of a cloud. At night, it was cold because there were no clouds to cover the heat from, evapor from, the, the heat from going away. And God had to again provide a pillar of fire to give them heat and to give them light to keep the pests away. He provided their every single need. In fact, the Bible says that the shoes on their feet did not wear out the whole time they were in the wilderness. Brothers and sisters, everything we need is met by God just like it was back then. We work. You say, well, I provide for myself. My work is the one that provides for myself. But wait a minute. Did you really work or did God give you the energy to be able to work? Yet we whine even when He provides all our needs sometimes. But it is a place of total reliance upon God, number one. Number two, it is a place of open miracles. You see, during those 40 years, like we said already, food, shade, light, water was all provided supernaturally. But all these miracles ended when they crossed the Jordan. Today also miracles happen. The miracles go from being open miracles to subtle ones. Some of us have often wondered if we live in a Laodicean age, but there are so many people who are addicted to miracles and signs. The gifts of the Holy Spirit happen today also. But let us not hold God hostage to miracles. He is sovereign and He can do what He said 
but let us not hold him hostage to miracles. You see, once the people got to the promised land, people went from seeing the miracles openly daily to being the miracle themselves. This is the life of a mature believer. Mature believers don't talk much about visions and dreams that they have seen or just the miraculous, miraculous life. Historically, mankind does not handle miracles very well. Even Yeshua, Jesus, healed their bodies and it did not have much impact on them. If you remember, he fed 5,000 and 4,000. And how many were at the cross when he was crucified? He healed so many people. Yet how many were at the cross? I would beg to say not, not any at all. One time he healed ten lepers. How many came back to thank him? One person. Do only 10% get impacted by miracles? Brothers and sisters, God is calling us to a life of maturity. And when you cross over the Jordan to fruitfulness, you will find subtle miracles instead of the open ones. Number three, it is a place of learning about God and ourselves. We can only know God to the extent that we know ourselves. There are things we need to see about Him and then compare it to ourselves and see if they're okay or they need fixing. The two go hand in hand. There is no way a person can get to know God without making profound changes in his own life. As we draw closer to God, it is like God presents a mirror. And when we look in the mirror, we really understand what our condition is. And when we understand that, we have a choice to take our lives and get it more attuned to what he wants us to be. You see, on Pentecost, the Jews celebrate giving the Torah. The mixed multitude heard God in their own language at the bottom of Mount Sinai, according to some Jewish writings. Today, Christians celebrate the 50 day after Passover as Pentecost. Many of us know in the churches we have Pentecost. This was the day that the Holy Spirit came down to empower us, empower believers. But you see, the two go hand in hand. You need the Word and you need the Spirit. You cannot have one or the other and have a victorious believer's life. You see, they are like the two wings of a bird. In order for flight to happen, you need both the Word and the Spirit to get you airborne. Let us not look at just the Spirit, but the Spirit will point us to His Word, because that Word is what will cleanse us and make us more and more in tune with Him. The next one, it is, is a place about learning about freedom. You see, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, they were, bond, they were in slavery, they were in bondage. Freedom came to the people through the hand of a lawgiver. If you remember, Moses was the lawgiver. Without rules, there is no freedom. Imagine driving down the road and there are no absolute Nero rules. Would you have freedom? You'd be afraid to cross because you don't know what the other driver would do at intersections. On the one hand, go anywhere you want, but on the other hand, it can be deadly. But brothers and sisters, restrictions provide freedom. Proper restraints on life provide riches and freedom. The next thing it does, it prepares us, the wilderness prepares us for a place of fruitfulness. Everything that is happening in the wilderness is for entering into maturity for fruitfulness. Now we need to understand that a lot of us get comfortable in, the, in wherever we are, but the desert is not a permanent place. It is a temporary place, so we do not want to put our tents down and have our golf course and say, you know, this is where I want to be and this is where I will stay. No. God wants us to go through the wilderness. It is a place of death. The wages of sin is death. So let us die to ourselves and get on with life. 
When God calls a man, according to Bonhoeffer, he bids him to come and die to himself. The body will die on a given day in the future, but everything inside can die now and get on with the business of life. You see, dying to our sense of security and self, we can be a living sacrifice. We deserve to die. Praise God for death, because it is the only way, the only thing that will take us beyond sin. You see, death is the door to freedom through Messiah. But how do we die? We need to come to the altar. If you remember in the, in, the, in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, there is a dedication of the altar. In Numbers chapter 7, verse 10, 11, and 84, if you go home and read, it talks about the dedication of the altar. Why is the altar singled out? Where the prince of each tribe brought wagons of silver and gold and fine flour? This dedication happened for 12 days, by the way, because the altar is a place of death. But it is not just a place of death, it is also the gateway to God. You see, we bring an Ola, an offering that goes up. We die to it and let it die to us. And as we do that, we get closer to God. The wilderness also makes us listen to God. If you look at Numbers chapter 7, Verse 89, it tells us an amazing thing here. Now when Moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim. So he spoke to him. God is speaking from above the mercy seat between the cherubim. If you remember earlier, God spoke at Mount Sinai. And it was so loud and it was so thunderous that the people were like dead men. They told Moses, you go and listen to God and come back and tell us what God says. But in this, in this verse, God is giving instructions from the tabernacle. His voice is not thunderous anymore, but it does not even go past the curtain. It is now a whisper. How can this be when he created everything with a voice? How is it now a whisper? See, on Mount Sinai, it was for a short time, with no limitation of space. But in the tabernacle, he spoke all the time, but limited by a very small space. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says you are the temple of a holy God. The tabernacle is a picture of each of us. And when we have truly recognized the power of the altar and dedicated the altar and placed ourselves on the altar, then we draw to God. He does not have to yell to us anymore, but we can come to Him and hear His whisper, not just once, but constantly. This is why Romans, Paul says in Romans, present yourself as living sacrifices. We need to die every day. Our self needs to die. The flesh needs to die every day so that the Lord, the King of the universe, can be the Lord of our lives. I hope you understand how the wilderness journey that we go through can bring us and draw us closer to God. We can hear His voice day by day. We can open the scriptures we can listen to what he has to say. As we read the scripture, the Holy Spirit will enlighten us, certain passage to us, like it has never done before. And that is that sweet voice of his whispering to us and our souls. And as we bring our souls more and more in line with him, we come into spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is not being able to espouse doctrines and theologies and all that. Spiritual maturity comes from your character. And your character becomes more and more and more like Jesus. We have a song that says, to be like Jesus. To be like Jesus, that's what I want. And this is where we mature to become more and more like the head, Jesus. 
I want to talk about another topic. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 through 27, we have a benediction. This is called the Aaronic benediction. And we can turn there really quick. Go to Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. So shall they invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. You see, each of those phrases from verse 24 to 26, they have two parts. May God bless you and keep you. Let's look at the first, first verse. May the Lord bless you and keep you. God wants to bless you. But not just to bless you, He wants to keep you. The word keep there is the word shamor or shamar. It's a very interesting word. In the Hebrew, it means to safeguard or to protect. So what he is saying is God is going to protect you and keep you and safeguard you. When we go through life's journeys and we have all these problems, when we call upon the name of the Lord, he will guard us and he will protect us and we are going to be the apple of his eye. The next phrase says, May God, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. You see, when people in darkness have the light shone on them, usually they want to scatter like bugs. If you come into a dark room that has roaches or other bugs and you turn the light on, you see all of them scampering to go into their holes. You see, when God's face shines upon us, we definitely need him to be gracious to us. His light is always showing us things that require His grace. But this verse says that He will make His face to shine upon you and He will be gracious to you. How awesome a God we serve, that He is gracious to us and He is ever wanting to bless us and looking forth for us to draw closer to Him. The third part of it, it says, May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you his peace. When this phrase is found in the, in the Bible, it is usually a very bad thing. Because God is setting his face against someone. It, was a neg it has a negative connotation. It's like being in a room where everything is quiet and someone does something bizarre and they are in trouble. But here it says, he is not here to drop the hammer on you, but to bring peace into your life. We need to have His peace in our lives. Let's take a look at this passage. If you did a word count on these three lines, in the Hebrew, there are three lines. The first line has three words. The second line has five. And the third line has seven words. The total of that is 15 words. Now, in Hebraic thought, again, I'm not talking numerology here. They had letters to represent numbers. So 15 words can be broken down as into two letters. Yud and He. And we know Yud and He stand for Yah. Yah is short form for God's name. So these two letters or the number of words are basically representing the name of God. God who is gracious. God who loves you. Now let's look at the letter count. There are 15 letters in the first line, 20 letters in the second line, and 25 letters in the third line. These are multiples of five. Five is the number that represents mercy and grace. You see, there are five books of Moses because it is an expression of God's mercy on his people. The first five books in Hebraic thought are called the Torah, what we call the Pentateuch. But the Pentateuch or the Torah is not punishing and legalistic. 
It is not a judgmental document. The Torah is filled with grace. You see, back in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God always saved by grace through faith. Abraham believed and it was counted as righteousness. There is no sacrifice in the Old Testament that took away known sins. And so we need to understand that God's grace is the only way that you could get the sins covered that were committed when you knew that they were sins. So the letter count, again multiples of five, show that God is a God of mercy. Now, let's look at the number of letters actually in all those words together. The total, if you add them up, is 60. The 60 letters stand for the, for the letter Samic. And now Samic is an interesting letter. Samic means support. And what that means is this God who is gracious to you will also support you. When we are bent down and we are downtrodden, this God who, is, who loves you and who wants to be gracious to you will also support you and lift you up. You see, He gives us the strength and the support we need. In Songs of Solomon, chapter 3 and verse 7 through 8, it says, Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon. The word there for couch is mate or bed. And it says, Sixty mighty men of Israel took that bed. Sages say that these sixty warriors are the image of the sixty letters of the blessing. The word of God has the sword that destroys God's enemies. And who is God's enemy? It's Satan. Brothers and sisters, we need to be careful when we use the Word of God because it is a weapon and the only opponent against whom the weapon is used is against the enemy, not against our brothers and sisters. One last thing in this is that the most common letter, if you look, is the letter Yud. This letter is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and you can find it 13 times in this blessing. The, the letter Yud shows the spirit is love, because 13 is the number for love. So this God, who is gracious, who wants to support us, is also the one who loves us. And this is the God of the Old Testament. And it's the same God who came down in the form of man and died for us by saying he loved the world so much that he came and became the sacrifice for us. Do we know this Lord? Do we have peace with this Lord? I urge you, brothers and sisters, if you are still distraught after chasing the world around and the pleasures of the world and found them to be vain and empty, I ask you, that you turn and look at Jesus and he will be the Prince of Peace, the one who brings you joy and blessings. And most of all, fellowship with him so that you can have eternal life. If you do not know him, I ask that you bow your heads with me as we say a short prayer together. Say these words with me, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for being the Lord who sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary. O oh God, I submit myself to you. I ask you to forgive my sins and come and become my Savior and my Lord. Take over my life. I don't want to live it my way anymore, but I want to follow you. Be the Lord of my life. Save me, O God, because that is what you came for. In Christ's name, Amen. If you've said that prayer, I urge you to contact a church nearby and join it so that you can also start your journey of spiritual maturity. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless.